Hello and welcome along to the RT Rugby Podcast and we are undergoing a little bit of a few tweaks over the next couple of months. Obviously, normally you'll be used to us coming to you on Wednesday afternoons, but the World Cup needs something a little bit special and as such, we're going to be ramping that up over the course of the tournament. We'll have at least two pods each week. There'll be Tuesdays and Thursdays, more or less, between now and the rest of the World Cup. And even if Ireland get knocked out at the pool stages, we will keep up that scheduled two maybe even a third podcast each week if there's some big and breaking news. To kick off our RT Rugby World Cup podcast, though, we're delighted to be joined by a nice centre partnership, James Downey and Darren Cave. Fellas, thanks a million for joining us. Thanks for having us. Actually, that that reminds me, Ireland centre partners, what year was that, Jimmy? 2013, yeah. Yeah, it was a capped match. Neil, before you ask, thank you very much. Doesn't matter. It was indeed, thank you. They all count. (laughs) They all count. So who was who was what what was the the breakdown of the breakdown of labor in that center partnership? Who was doing the was it like old fashioned center stuff where you've one person doing the dirty stuff and one person gets to do the fun stuff? Both of us talking smack, neither of us working too hard, neither right. of us passing the ball. It sounds about right. They were they had them flowed very well. We dovetailed yeah. nicely, we dovetailed nicely, and then Ferg McFadden he did all the work. <laughs> Well, specifically, I got the two Youngs. I have a couple of questions around the Irish centres uh, a little bit later on. We'll get into it, though. Ireland-Romania this Saturday, Stade de Bordeaux, half past two Irish time. Uh, it's going to be live on RT Radio 1, and you can follow a live blog on the RT Sport app as well. Um, I checked the weather forecast yesterday, lads, for this weekend in Bordeaux. Um, It's going to be around 35 degrees when the match kicks off, which is... um. Similar enough to what it's like in my little box room where I'm recording at the moment as well, uh, even though I've got the window open. So if I get redder and redder as this podcast goes on, that'll explain it. But listen, I, I, honestly, like 35 degrees, it's no conditions to be playing a game in rugby, a game of rugby. And thankfully, Ireland are going to be massive favourites and should beat Romania, all things considered, this weekend, Darren. But um, it's going to be interesting just to see how they deal with those conditions, obviously. Yeah, of course, it's a little different, isn't it? Um, I don't think, I think the way uh, the club game is now, I don't think it'll come as um, like a huge shock, if that makes sense. I mean, these are guys that have been playing in South Africa for a few years. Um, they've been playing like uh, obviously in France, but I, I think more so when the Italian teams joined the, the URC and you had these fixtures in September and at the end of the year when there was 30 plus degrees. So listen, it'll be hot. Um, it certainly won't be an excuse for either team. I think um, obviously the ball will be a bit slippy and uh, from from sweat, which is actually worse than rain. But like, I don't think it should have a huge bearing on the game. And I suppose from a supporter point of view, I would rather it was like that than it was f- uh, for the last game in France a couple of weeks ago. That's a fair point. Yeah, that's a that's a very fair point. Um, crucially though, like when I was thinking about it, and four years ago, obviously there was a, a massive heat factor, James, as well in Japan, but. Humidity was probably the bigger thing there. Again, I was looking at the forecast. While it's going to be incredibly hot, there isn't going to be much humidity there. You're right in the coast in Bordeaux. It's, and I don't know, depending on what maybe way the the shadows are coming in, you might find a a nice little a nice little patch of shade in the stadium as well. Yeah, look, it's it's a case of um, players are well used to it now, as Darren mentioned there, and it's it's they're used to playing in France, they're used to playing in these conditions, and they'll have that breeze. Uh, you're right in what you say about Japan. That was a that was a different situation, but these players are well conditioned to it. They'll they they'll have done their Portuguese training, and I'm sure it'll stand to them when they get over to to France. But look, once they're in there, uh, again, I agree with Darren. It's it's not going to have too much impact on the game. It's it's going to be tough out there for some of them. You know, maybe I uh, might see a few people cramping, but um, hopefully not too badly. But ultimately. Um, I don't think it's going to have too much of an impact. It'd be nice for the supporters and hopefully the sun cream will be out. Yeah, I was going to say, would it have a, gr- a greater impact on the supporters than the players? <laughs> well, there, there will be a few people potentially having a, a few hours yeah, beforehand. <laughs> having a few drinks and uh, yeah, a few red faces after. Staying hydrated. Yeah, ultimately, no excuses, but you look at Romania's recent games and Darren, they would have to be pulling off probably the greatest shock in the history of the tournament to to beat Ireland on on Saturday afternoon and without being complacent there's this there is the scope for Andy Farrell to be able to treat this like a fourth warm-up game uh yeah totally agree and I think like as a as an Irish public and as pundits 
I think it's okay for us to be complacent. It it doesn't matter if 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 I think this game uh, won't be super close because the team will be motivated. Um, I mean, like I laugh about it all the time. The only ever World Cup fixture I played in was against Romania, and believe you me, like there was not one percent of me that was in any way complacent. I don't expect it of the group. Um, it's been a long time since they've been beaten. And I fully expect them to have far too much in the tank for Romania. Uh, and again, the way our fixtures have been structured, you could argue that sometimes it would be easier if you were to start with bigger games and then have, let's not call them down weeks, let's not be disrespectful. Um, so the upside for Ireland is that we can build in and um, again, not being res- disrespectful, I don't expect Romania or Tonga to be substantially better than what we've faced in our, our last three games. Um, and then the challenge for Ireland is, you know, having enough in, in the tank to pull through those games, but then having to win uh, up. Well, if you want to win the World Cup, which they do, that's their goal to win five weeks in a row against top quality opposition. That's the challenge for Ireland. And so I do believe that this is a turning of the dial for Ireland, as opposed to starting with a big bang. Yeah, I was actually going to ask that a little bit later on when I was talking about France and New Zealand, but I might just bring it in now then. So obviously just the difference in the layout of the matches, as Darren explained there, James, like that Ireland have a nice tune-up fight, I suppose, to to put it in boxing speak, to, to start the tournament with. Gets a little bit tougher for Tonga, and then you've got the big one against South Africa and another big one against Scotland. And if you get through those, it's obviously big games all the way, and it's a slow build up towards the biggest games. Whereas you look at France and New Zealand this weekend where they can both go hell for leather at it. And even if, even for the team that does lose realistically, they just have to avoid a banana skin against Italy over the next few weeks. And they have this period of four, four or five weeks where they can just slowly charge themselves up again for another crack at a, at a quarter final, which would you which would you prefer as a player? Uh, is, is it an each to their own situation? Well, I think you look at what happened before. Was that we play or played Australia um, in that opening game? There was such a focus in Australia. If we beat Australia, then we always beat the Welsh. We'll be fine. And then we go and lose to the Welsh, you know, having built up to that one big game. Um, was that four years or eight years ago? I can't remember. Um, that was 2011. Was, yeah. And so 20, 20, 2015, then, for example, you know, you'd Romania along the way as well. And the last pool game was against France and so much went into it. And obviously there was an enormous physical toll coming out of it into the quarterfinal against Argentina. Yeah, it's 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 one of those. Listen, it's going to be a hindsight answer. Um, in, in 2015, when I was there, I think we went Canada, Romania, Italy, uh, France in that order, which is perfect. Just ramping the dial, ramping the dial. But actually what happened was uh, the further you came along, um, people picked up bands and people picked up injuries. And um, that is going to be the challenge for Ireland. Like if, if if you start with a bang with a huge fixture and then you maybe had a couple of games after, you have players, especially the way the game is now with head knocks. It's not a, it's it, like there are going to be, and bands. There's a lot of players getting banned at the minute. There's a lot of players getting um, uh, head checks and, and concussions at the minute. There are players that are going to be missing for one, two weeks. Uh, and as you the way the fixtures are laid out for Ireland, it's, it'll be a, it'll be a, a, a tough run. Um, the where the other side of it, I, I do believe Ireland are the most prepared they've ever been in terms of depth. Um, people love talking about that twenty fifteen World Cup and the lack of depth, which I actually find quite insulting. Um, because <laughs> I was one of the ones. Uh, <laughs> but um, listen. I'm just here to be honest. Uh, I think the likes of Finley Balam has really improved. I, I, the game he played uh, in in the against the box last November for me kind of dispelled this myth that whilst Tag Furlong is a world class player, if he's not there, we're fudged. We're not. Finley Balam's a quality player, uh, and it's 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 a real boring kind of soundbite. But for me, it's 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 just Sexton. Um, I believe Ireland are the best team in the world when Johnny Sexton. Is is playing and it's it's nothing against Ross Byrne or Crowley. Really good players. I just think Ireland are a top five team or a top three team when he's not playing. So for, for and that's going to be interesting um about selection over these first two games to get him to a level whereby 
he is at his absolute best for a guy who hasn't played in in absolute months. And it's going to be interesting to watch. And I'm glad I'm not actually making the decisions myself. I think yeah. though. Sorry, Neil. I think on the back of that, like of of Sexton coming in, I think he's one of these players and the modern player now. You don't need two or three games to kind of get into it. I think you see like Robbie Henshaw can do it, Tiger's done it before. These players get dropped into it and they're ready to go straight away. It's not as if he needs to get a bulk of games under him. Okay, he's done a little bit in Portugal. I'm sure they're running him out in um in camp. He's doing plenty there, but he will. I expect him to start this Romanian game just to get into it. Get used to, uh, get used to playing. Be they play at a half, give them forty minutes to get them into the legs, and then bring on or reward someone else. Um, Ross Byrne hasn't had great minutes, so Jack Crowley deserve it. Like there's some tough selections, as as Darren said, but jo- uh, Jonathan certainly needs to to play in that first game and get some minutes in his legs, and then hopefully build up second one, and and then he's raring to go for the third. On Johnny, the the fact as well that not only is he coming in off a, a long spell, but this is his last. His last campaign in rugby, um, he has four or five, maybe six games left, depending on on how well things go. We've seen it in the past with some players where this this idea of the last dance can bring them on to, to even greater levels. We've seen at other times with players where the the pressure of it gets a bit too much. One for both of you, I suppose, how confident are you that we will see the the better side of Johnny Sexton dealing with the the last hurrah, so to speak. Um, listen, it's a, it's a really interesting question. So the first thing I should say, I fully agree with with James. Uh, I'm actually not worried about his form at all. Uh, I just think the quality of player he is, the influence he has on the group. Um, I think, listen, this is this is a very un Irish time for us, right? Because, like. We've loved for years, like from when I was growing up watching Ireland, being the underdog and, and creating this chip on the, the shoulder mentality that everyone hates us and nobody respects us and, and all these reasons to make us punch above our weight. I think as, as an Irish person, what I find scary about this World Cup is that like we, we don't need any of that. Like We we literally, I saw something on, on Opta a week or two ago and uh, there was some like artificial intelligence used over the, la- the last 10 years worth of fixtures to play at the World Cup 10 million times. And Ireland won it the highest amount of percentage of times. Like so, I don't think we need this. Do you know what I mean? I don't think we need extra motivation. I don't think Johnny Sexton's swung song comes into it. I think um, it's. I think Ireland. I I think Ireland are the best team in the World Cup. And people love saying, "Oh, but the Springboks this and oh, France are at home and oh, the All Blacks will come good and oh, England could do something." And I I wouldn't disagree with any of those points. But what I would say, who wants to play us? Like, I've absolutely no doubt that nobody will be licking their lips at playing Ireland. Absolutely nobody. Because Ireland have beaten them, beaten every single one of them, you know, uh, not every time, but consistently over the last four years. There's probably no team that, that's that's better off against us in a head-to-head. So, um, yeah, I don't think, I think we need to keep the, the Keith Earls sort of, uh, all that emotive stuff in the background and just stick to our plan. I, I think they're really well prepared and that's them well and truly scudded now. Does that say a lot then just about how they've they've changed over the last few years where the the motivating factors are less about passion and occasions and things like that and it's more just about the X's and O's of, of rugby? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think what, what Darren says there is quite interesting in terms of like we look at that passion. Like we used to play England per se and I'd be kind of going, oh, geez, this is a big game. Like we really need to really step up to this, you know. Then we played them this year in the Aviva in the last game. I was like, um, we'll win this quite handily. It just depends on how much, you know. And they're so comfortable and it's the mindset change that we have to get used to in this country. Completely agree that it's it's like we are one of the better teams or if not the best team in the world out there. We deserve, we have a good chance of winning this World Cup and I think it's the players believe it and they will go out there, do their jobs. They're professional players. It's not about hand on heart anymore and getting 20 minutes out of it and trying to hang on then it's we're in control we know what we have to do when we do everything we need to do we're better than most of these teams as as Darren said there we've beaten every team out there so I completely agree with him there in terms of uh, who wants to play Ireland yeah I don't think don't think anyone realistically will want to play them the the team for this weekend going to be announced on Thursday in a couple of days time Um, what are you expecting from us just in terms of the the breakdown, 
would you be thinking along the lines that Andy Farrell will be going as close to full strength as he can and make some rotations then for Tonga to rest up a couple of bodies ahead of South Africa? Or would you be picking the the kind of combined A and B team and then building up slowly into into Tonga? What would be the personal preference there? I I think um there's there's different ways to do it. And genuinely, like I'm I'm happy it's not it's not me because it's all riding on what happens in like those that South Africa game and the Scotland game. Um I think there's a really strong argument to play like half a team against Romania and half a team against Tonga. But then are you going to go into South Africa without having a fully loaded team? You know, uh, that's a big, big, brave call. Um, But then again, when South Africa comes along, your rotation is kind of over. And maybe a cup, but you're you're like, uh, ironically, of, of all the teams that I think could overachieve at the World Cup, if it, if they weren't in if they were in a different group, I would actually say Scotland. Mm. So I think Scotland are more the banana skin. I think they're a really good side, um, and I wouldn't be surprised if 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 they won three games at this World Cup, honestly. Um, so I, I genuinely, uh, I know I'm here to provide insight. <laughs> I've I've no idea what he's um what he's going to do. I mean, he has to use squad players, um, but at the same time, like it's all about being locked and loaded, um, for that Springbok game. Uh, and to get even deeper into it, I suppose the other interesting thing about this World Cup, and it's interesting to listen to James before, the, the reward for topping your pool has always been so so high. Um, and actually, this World Cup, for the first time ever, from an Irish point of view, the reward for topping your pool uh, is is much of a muchness because you've no yeah. idea what's going to happen on Friday. And I'm not saying that it's okay to lose a pool game. I'm saying that you could easily lose a pool game and end up with the better of the two quarter finalists between, I'm assuming, France or New Zealand. Um, so I've just talked in a, a circle there for for two minutes. Does that answer your question, Neil? Did I list, did I, did I <laughs> well, list the team you know, for this week? In 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 in, fa- in fairness, you know, I was looking for insight, not intel on what Andy Farrell is thinking. <laughs> but um, I've no idea. I've no yeah. idea. Personal personal preference, James. Would you like to see as as close as he can to to full strength? Obviously. You know, Dan Sheehan probably wouldn't be playing because, you know, just nurse that out. But like, it looks like Ronan Keller is fully fit. Obviously, we'll want to see him back. Johnny Sexton should be there. But in terms of the, like, the top ranking second row partnerships, first choice back row center partnerships, those combinations, would you like to see them getting out early in this tournament? Um, yeah, well, I'd, I'd say I'd go for 10 starters out of 15, maybe, and kind of have, have combinations there. I want, I'd like to see the combinations. If it's back three, that's going to be different. Have the midfield kind of the same, your 10, 12, 13, and have your back row the same and uh, your second row. Just keep the combinations that are used to playing with that person and getting used to it. Um, obviously, niggles and bands are, are going to happen, and um, and that's when your squad rotation is going to come in, but you're going to trust that player, say, in the next game, who's going to get game time too. And look, I'm sure they've seen enough in camp of what's going on, but I'd like to see... Uh, our first team combinations in the in the key positions play as as much as they can, especially kind of I know with Johnny. Um, but if he, if it's going to be with Jemison Gibson Park, let those two get together and uh, look, there've been Leinster teammates I know, but just to just to crank that up again and get used to playing with each other again. Yeah, and I think on that. Uh, sorry to jump in, Neil. It'll be stuff that maybe we haven't analysed that deeply in terms of like I don't disagree with James of the ten starters, right? It might be a little more. Well, who who in their outings so far looks undercooked, and who looks like they're absolutely flying? So you know, again, it's 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 funny you're here to provide insight, but you're doing nothing but ask more. I'm doing nothing but ask more questions. Part of me thinks like I like when Doris plays, right? Because I just think he's that good, and I just think your chances of winning are higher when he plays. Um. But then I would look at him and go, well, he's a guy who looks like at the minute, he doesn't look like a guy who you're going, right, he, he, he's undercooked. Played all, know, three, so, played all three warm-up games as well. Yeah, yeah. So I would be saying, well, I would like to see him play him because when he plays, we win. <laughs> not always, and it's not as simple as that. Um, plus, you're always still going like, well, yeah, listen, Guy Ringrose, always nice when he plays. I actually thought he looked all right and when he played. Other, Not everyone agreed. Um, but he's a guy, like, does he need minutes or do we need other players to play there just to keep ticking up their minutes? Uh, Keenan's another good example at fullback. 
like he's one of the first names on the team sheet. Are we better off getting him out and getting him sizzling? Is Farrell confident with how he's trained and how he's played? Are we actually better off go? I know Jimmy O'Brien picked up the bang. Are we better off getting the guys who haven't had minutes more minutes? Um, so again, not answering many questions, but there's um, uh, I, I definitely trust this coaching team's plan and the macro that they're looking at. And I think on that one, they'll be looking so far forward as well that they'll be managing minutes. There's an expectation as well that they're going to go far in this tournament. So um, it's not going to be a case of uh, we're not going to play players and then all of a sudden they'll have to play every single week and and then we'll run out run out of steam, you know. I think it's there's a plan in place that they'll have, that the coaching staff will have, and we just kind of have to trust them. Looking ahead further into the tournament then at the South Africa and Scotland games, um, centre partnership. What, in your opinion, is the first choice duo in there? Um, because it's it's been a bizarre position where over the years it's been it's been so rare where all well we say all three, but throw in Stuart McCluskey now because he's part of that that group of four where all of those those frontline centres have been available. A lot of time the selection has been dictated by who is actually fit and available. What would be your first choice too? Don't don't um, don't jump in ahead of each other now to answer <laughs> this one. Well, the first one I will say, I I think I don't think it was the, in the plan to bring four centers who I know Guy Ringers can play on the wing. I don't like him as a winger because yeah. I think he's one of our best players at thirteen. I think Stuart McCluskey forced his hand and just played so well over the past. Like typically, I think coaches go right. Well, I want three nines, three tens, and then they build it like that. I don't think he'll have sat down and I'll go. I want four centers that are out and out centers, but I think his hand's been forced with McCluskey's form. Um, for me, it's without doubt ring rows of 13 plus one um i i still feel as well as he's played that mccluskey is, is probably slightly behind the other two and i would imagine if you asked a lot of people you would get a lot of different answers and they do bring different things i, I personally believe best it'll be Henshaw and Ringrose. So I think it'll be Ringrose plus one. And I think if Henshaw has shown enough in training and shown enough form and maybe gets minutes over the next couple of weeks and looks near his best or really strong, I think that is the optimal uh, pairing for Ireland. Yeah, similar. Um, I think I would go with with Robbie and and Gary straight away. I I always would. I'd always lean towards that. They used to play with each other, their combinations, they dovetail nicely. And I think um, Bundy, I think, has certainly pushed um, because Robbie hasn't been as good as maybe in the last while, uh, and Bundy's certainly trying to push it, but he's pushing Robbie to perform every week too. Uh, and I think McCluskey just brings that little bit extra. Um, I just see him as potentially playing in the first two games, um, and then seeing how they go. I think if you're going to go physical. I would go for Bundy more so than Robbie, you know. Um, again, depending on your opposition, you can alternate that right regard. But for for starting p- uh, partnership, it's got to be um, got to be Robbie and Gary. Because then, as I look at it as well, you've got if you have Jemison, you've got Johnny, you've got Robbie, you got Gary, four Lencer lads who play week in week out with each other, and know know what everyone does the whole time, and uh, they don't need that much time together to to have to to know what each other's thinking. You wonder, and you wonder, just could it slightly work against Robbie the fact that he's um our our call it backup number thirteen? Now, I have heard some stats recently. I think he's actually might have played more games at thirteen than twelve for Ireland, or maybe it's that stat under Farrell or whatever it is. But I I wonder in terms of a starting role, could that slightly work against them if he's getting because he is going to have to play minutes at thirteen, right? Uh, I think people. Uh, McCluskey and Aki played in the centre together against Italy last year. Probably didn't go as as bad as everyone thought, but it felt like the one narrative of Italy was that Bundy and and Stewart can't play together. Um, so I just wonder, could that slightly work against Robbie equally? He could play thirteen in one of the first two games, get his confidence up, get a stormer, and then you, you slip him in to that sort of four uh, or five players, six players. Actually, if you include uh, two of the back three years and and make a real strong um strong backline for Ireland, yeah, it's certainly not a, a an area of the pitch where you're questioning any depth for Ireland anyway. That's for that's for certain. Um, one of the final points to make on on Ireland, you kind of hinted at it earlier on, Darren, just with cards and even things like head injuries and stuff like that that are going to take a little bit longer. 
specifically though on the cards this feels like it's going to be the world cup of the of the yellow and red card because it's just happening so often the importance of keeping 15 players on the pitch at all times and it's something i've brought up in the podcast a good bit over the the last few months um i've been keeping tabs on the cards that the the rugby championship and six nation sides have been picking up so those 10 sides over the last 2 years ireland have had two yellow cards in their last 24 games which is just serious going of the the six nations and rugby championship sides combined that's two cards for ireland out of 172 cards combined across the 10 so ireland are accounting for just over 1% of the cards that those 10 teams have picked up this would not be a good time to to start picking up a couple of cards with it after a couple of years of of very very good work no one and, and i'm genuinely i'm scared to say too much about it because i know how these uh, clips resurface um after an incident which may or may not happen but no don't, don't uh, worry because i threw out that statistic i will be burying this clip if uh, okay if so if something uh, again listen um i do think in terms like we're chatting about emotion and uh you know you think back I, i i totally agree with james thinking back of like you know scream scream the anthem and try and knock england's heads off like it's different now and you know i uh, Ireland are the best disciplined and disciplined international rugby team in the world, right? I, I I'm not sure where that stems from, but that is the facts. They are prop like you're t- actually this is your fact, Neil. So don't try and sign back me with this. If there's a red card in the World Cup, statistically the least likely team of the big teams to get a card. And uh, that's fact. That's not my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is my opinion, but it's fact. Um, it definitely, it definitely with the way fixtures and our big players, um, it doesn't take much to get a two three week ban that you know that happens against scotland and a player is out for the world cup um and i do think it's an area which has helped ireland excel and you know i'm a big fan of of this uh bunker kind of idea and you know probably surprised that in all of this and we we love to criticize world rugby and you know i, I would be in the party that thinks some of the farrell personal in fact the personal criticism of Owen Farrell has been a bit ridiculous and and frankly wrong but i do think it's strange how much as like a rugby public like the players have got to do better like you like this is this is not new now this is like if i think the Billy Vinopola incident against Ireland and i was watching him complain to the referee as he was being carded and 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 I thought the process from the officials was brilliant. He just said, "Meets the threshold for a yellow card. See you later." And and Vinapol and I thought to myself, I would genuinely love to hear his defense, genuinely, because he's led with the shoulder. Um, you know, his arms tucked. There's force, and it's hit him on the chin. I just I find it that we're very quick to criticize world rugby and referees and think the players have got to do better. And uh, it's going to be a great World Cup on that front because if the players don't do better um, in terms of lowering their body height, not having sloppy technique, they're going, they, they are going to be punished and their teams are going to be punished massively. So, um, yeah, I, I do think it's something that's strongly in Ireland's favour, not just in the tackle, like in the game. They don't give sides a lot um, and it makes a big difference. Yeah, and ultimately, James, it does go to show that this isn't a this isn't a thing about luck. Sometimes you you just there are yellow and red cards, and people say, "Well, what can a player do? He can't get out of that situation." And the the numbers would show that certain sides are picking up a lot more yellows and red cards than other, and the numbers also show that the likes of Ireland and France are streets ahead of a lot of other teams when it comes to discipline. So it does show that like coaching comes into it and and teaching players the correct ways to to go into these tackles and to go into rocks to avoid getting themselves in these situations exactly and i think it's that measured approach again of of the irish players being in control of of the top two inches and knowing what they have to do and doing the right thing but also getting out of there um even like instead rolling away not giving away these lazy penalties but yeah it's it's the players own is you know what you have to do when you see someone running you know you've got to drop if you're tall fairly you've got to get down low and it's it's taken out that macho um mindset of trying to do someone damage and put a shoulder in when you know you can get a good shot on someone but you've got to get a fair shot as well and that's thinking for the team and not thinking for yourself just to get one over on someone i think as well i think that that's the whole 
team unity and uh, unison that they have with Andy Farrell and the way they've coached them. Um, I really think that the players are, are smart players now. Okay, look, you're going to get maybe the seatbelt tackle. Sometimes that can be reactive, but I think for the main, uh, I think a lot of the ones, the Irish players certainly are, are, are much more aware of what they're trying to do. And I think it's going to be, it's going to have such a huge impact on this World Cup, you know, because teams are going to lose players that uh, it's going to cost them massively and they won't have expected it. And hopefully, as uh, Darren said there, won't come back to bite us in the ass that uh, your stats that you've dropped in there. and Neil stats. Neil stats. Get a few. <laughs> yeah, Neil stats, exactly. Stato. Well, hopefully we don't have to talk about too many yellow and red cards in general over the World Cup, let alone from, from Ireland. Moving on to some of the other games this weekend, it, it's actually a great lineup of matches across the week. For like for an opening weekend, you throw in France, New Zealand uh, on top of it as well. South Africa and Scotland on Sunday, even Wales, Fiji on Sunday. I might look at, because it's Ireland's pool, South Africa, Scotland, which is in Stade Velodrome in Marseille on Sunday evening. Darren kind of hinted at his thoughts on Scotland a little bit earlier, but James, what chances, what chances Scotland go and blow this pool and potentially this tournament wide open on Sunday. It's it's so interesting because I'm like I, I always think that Gregor Townsend his like uh his pre-match chat writes itself. It's so easy because he just goes in and goes, why are we even at this World Cup? No one's spoken about us. It's Ireland or South Africa. Like what's the point? You know, like we don't need to be here and stick up. You can stick up all the papers around the room and it's a motivator, you know, and it's like we don't even need to be here. So no one respects us. It's all about that. It's a, it's a, it's an easy force to drive these Scottish players to it. And all they need to do is, like, they're they're going under the radar, you know, their heads down, and no one's speaking about them. And all they got to do is produce maybe one game. Darren said three games. You'd expect them to win uh, the the two games against uh, Romania and against Tonga, and then it's they just need one more, you know, and. No better motivator than that, and you've you've got two shots at it to win one extra game. I'm playing some kind of like four D chess here, thinking ahead. But but Darren, like if Scotland were to beat South Africa this weekend, as for, with your Irish goggles on, would you would you like to see that, or would you be oh Jesus, all of a sudden South Africa are going to be playing Ireland, having to win to basically stay in the World Cup? Are we are we thinking way too ahead of these things, or would like? What would you like to see on the weekend between Scotland and South Africa from an Irish point of view? Oh, do you, do you know, you, you just don't know. Like, yeah. the, I, I'm not conv- the thing that uh, if I was a, a Bach fan or what gives me the chink of hope with the Harlem thing is I'm just not sold by this whole uh, number 10 situation. Um, I listen, I know they've got, if you look at all their players, they're probably their starting player in every position is probably top three, certainly top five in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, with the Pollard situation, like they played, they've played Willemsa in there, which is not his best position. I think Lebox a good player, but he, it's just such an important position. Um, that I sort of wonder, is that the chink uh, in their armor? Um, do I believe they're going to lose? I think, Bim, <laughs> I think they're they're too good a side to lose twice in the pool stages. I know rugby doesn't work like that, but I just yeah. can't see them losing twice. I'm not sure I'd be delighted to see them uh, beat Scotland or Scotland beat them. I, I genuinely I, I don't know. Um, and I think the Scotland one is 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 very interesting as well from an Irish point of view when it comes because I do think that that fixture has has gathered even like as much bite as it kind of ever has Ireland Scotland. I think there's this underlying. Kind of, it used to be that we'd we'd like connect to dislike England, um, and that was kind of all we had. And now it feels like like the Scots rate themselves and rightly so, but I think they have this opinion that we don't really rate them. And every year they talk up that this is your year and Stuart Hogg and Finn Russell and they've got it. And then every Six Nations we kind of flick them off without actually playing that well. So I think there's a lot of bite in that. Um, going to be a lot of bite and as James said like phenomenal motivation like those Scots are got like years of us kind of and as a public we, we don't really respect them that much like we fully expect every Six Nations to be like the, them and Italy are the, are the easiest games so the motivation they're going to have and what worries me about them other than the fact they've got quality players it seems like for the first time that like Gregor's kind of stopped trying to fight with Finn Russell you know, you, you rewind the clock two, three years ago and he was getting thrown out of camps. And then obviously there was a situation where Gregor had to kind of re-interview for his job. And and I wonder, is he just going, do you know what? 
been like, just go do your thing, mate. Just go do your thing. Um, and that makes them absurdly dangerous. On South Africa, James, the obviously the, the what 35 7 win against uh against New Zealand jumps out. Has your has your opinion of them changed over the last couple of months? During the rugby championship, it seemed like they were they were doing fine without doing anything spectacular. And then all of a sudden they pull that game out against New Zealand. And I think it's turned a lot of heads in the last few weeks. Yeah, certainly mine in that one in that regard. Um yeah, it's 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 building up to be such a cracking game. And just yeah, Darren mentioned there about uh, you wouldn't like to see um South Africa lose to Scotland. Um I don't know, I'd I think I'd like to see them lose to uh, lose to Scotland to be honest, yeah, because I just think that Ireland have the nous to 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 pull the, like to do a job on South Africa. You know, I think especially if they've lost, they would be the whatever wounded Springbok as you want to call it, and just think Ireland can do a job. And but look, I still think the size of the South African side. I know we go on about it, but my God, there are some big men. Um, can they do it for that whole consistent time and carry it around? I do think teams can find them out. I think that Ireland certainly are one of those teams who can find some sort of areas of weakness. I know when we played them before, they found some traction in, in, in those wide channels when you kind of move around these big guys. And I think that Ireland's game plan has really come along. I know I'm focusing on Ireland, South Africa a bit, but I just think that that's the kind of blueprint to, to get away from, from South Africa. I think, um, look, they have looked so good coming into it, but it's only until the game kicks off um, this weekend that we can see if they can bring that form in with them. And then... On the flip side, Darren, New Zealand, has your opinion of them changed at all in the, the last few months? Um, really, really unsure. Uh, I think with like the age profile of, of me mid thirties and and what happened in my career, I just I just struggled to buy into this concept that they're gonna be crap. Um I I don't know why. And, and maybe like and listen, when Ireland went down there, was it last summer, eighteen months ago? I did not expect Ireland to do what they did because maybe Maybe I have uh, um, too much respect for New Zealand because, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it's probably one of the best rugby sides ever. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, it's a very very hard question to answer. Um, I expect them to be improved, but I suppose the in terms of you, you think of 2015 and 2011 and the fear factor and, you know, I'm not sure any of the big, big teams can be petrified of New Zealand, um, given who's beaten them over the past two, three years, and given that South Africa result, you know, and I think that's a big thing. Um, confidence. I don't think anyone's I I I think traditionally teams will go into play in New Zealand like go on with no chance. I don't think teams will do that. I think teams will see them um uh being sort of there for the taking. And then just what an absolutely incredible first game we have on on Friday night, New Zealand and France at Stade de France. James, um, on France, so first with the Roman Entomac injury, Cyril Bay picks up a knock. He's out for the first few games of this. Uh, Paul Valencia out as of last week. Jonathan Dante looks like he's going to be a doubt for the start of the tournament as well. Bit by bit, there's a few injuries creeping up around France. And throw in on top of that now this controversy over the last few days after they called up uh, Bastian Chalro. For those who don't know, a lot of criticism of, of the Montpellier second row. He has a conviction uh, for a racially motivated assault, which he denies. Um, well, he denies it was racially motivated. Former France captain Thierry Doucetois is among those who've come out and have been very, very critical of his selection. And all of a sudden, James, between the injuries and this controversy now, they've found themselves with there's a lot of pressure. There's a few clouds building up on top of them as the host nation as well. It just has been interesting to see how, how things have tightened up around them over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I think they were pretty uh, on the crest of a wave before coming in the last couple of weeks and everything was working out rosy and now they've had a bit of uh, uh, a bit of adversity. And I, I suppose this could be the making or breaking of them. You know, I think with, with the French side especially, this could show bring this team together, get this unity. They've everyone on the outside um screaming, uh, giving out, and they just need to circle the wagons and kind of go, this is our group and let's get through this. And we're at home playing in front of our supporters. And you can certainly win over the French supporters with some performances and no better way to do that than on Friday night against the All Blacks of 
producing the performance, albeit, as you mentioned, some the four players there, some big, big players there that they're missing going into this game. Um, but it's the French, and I just think that they'll be uh, they'll be good enough to to do the All Blacks certainly, and then to go on. I think the more that it goes on, the more the French crowd will change their mindset into into what's going to happen um, and what's been going on outside, all the white noise outside, even though it is obviously extremely serious. But uh, I think that the, the French crowd have the ability to forget. Do you see them dealing with that pressure in the right way, Darren? Um, again, it's 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 hard to know. I feel like I haven't answered any of your questions. Sorry. Um, it's, uh, you know, tip. I mean, it comes down to what they do on the pitch, right? If things go well, and we all know um, they are sort of crap cliches, but they're also true, uh, the way the French public are and the way the, if they get their tails up, they're going to be so hard to beat. I mean, that's the crux of the of the, of the the World Cup, really. Can anybody beat France um, in France? Uh, and like that's what it'll come down to. If their tails are up um, and the, the French public and really embrace this World Cup like we seem to do... Um, can they deal with the expectation? Yes, they definitely can. And they are going to be, um, if they get things right, they're going to be seriously, seriously tough to beat. Um, but like, what a way to start the World Cup this weekend. Um, for some reason, I just am convinced that the All Blacks are going to be, um, they're not under the radar, right? They're the All Blacks. I'm just not convinced the All Blacks are going to be crap and they're going to rock up and roll over. Um, having said that, opening night, France in France, um, it's just going to be, as an Irish fan, it's the, it's the bad side of the draw. But if you are a neutral, the way this draw is being done, it's it's phenomenal because it's so fascinating. It's actually more fascinating on the other yeah. side of the draw as well because you're going to yeah. get you are for like you're going to get a I was about to say random. That's a bit disrespectful. You're going to get a team in the quarterfinals that you wouldn't suspect, be it a Georgia or a Fiji or I'm not convinced by Japan at the minute. So it's going to be a phenomenal World Cup. Well, that actually, that leads me nice to the, the final few quick fire questions I was going to throw at you. And one of them is, I I would have labeled it as dark horse, but if even if we want to broaden it ever so slightly, like a, an unheralded side that could, that you think could make a run to a quarter final even. Um, is it coming out of those pool C and D, like as you said, a, potentially a Fiji or a Samoa or someone like that out of pool D? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just it's listen, it's 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 fun. The dark horse one's funny because you don't want to be um sort of disrespectful. The likes of a Fiji, of course, but the Fiji have just um you know disposed of England fairly easy. Yeah. And I think are they up to eighth in the world? Yeah, I mean technically um, they're seventh in the world. So I mean technically by, by, by right not it should be in the quarter final. <laughs> yeah. So um listen, on our side of the group, I think Scotland are capable of doing something. Yeah. Um listen, it could have come down to bonus points and ultimately um they're I think they're a very good side and of all the teams complaining about their draw, they're probably should be top of that list. I can't really see Italy doing too much damage. And on the other side of the it's just a lottery on the other side of the draw, really. Uh Typically, I wouldn't be a big, um, uh, what's the word, like promoter of Australia. Uh, but I think just, I would just wonder with the Eddie Jones factor. I think the same with Wales. Wales look bang average, but um, I'm just convinced that Gatland will have them, uh, wouldn't take much to have them better than what we've seen. Um, and, and Fiji looks strong. Who knows? I, I get that Georgia could do something, but I'm not convinced they will. So, I don't know. It's an absolute. It's an absolute lottery, isn't it? Um, I think. I think Fiji have a real good chance the quarterfinals. But as I said, they're the seventeenth. Um, they're the seventh best team in the world. So it doesn't take a, a, a sort of rugby pundit to tell you that. You know, if a sophisticated algorithm tells you. It. Yeah, that's pool C and D is. It's going to be the absolute wild west. It's making for uh, some brilliant games. Um, the more the more simple predictions. Then, James, I'll go to you first. Who's winning the World Cup? More simple. Um, I think if France get their tails up um, at home, um, I, I just can't see beyond France. But I do think that Ireland have one hell of a shot at, uh, at trying to get to that final and trying to trying to bring home the cup. But I just, at the moment, can't see past France. I'm sure Darren will just sit in the fence. <laughs> um, do you know, it's, it's, it's one of those, like, you know, I mentioned that, uh, you know, 
10 million times of playing the World Cup. And I think the, the big four teams, as we'll call them, accounted for like 83% of the victories between the four. So I do think like, um, I, I think if France can keep the thing together, I think France, but I fully believe that Ireland can do it. And I, I think, of course, I believe the box can do it. While I don't think New Zealand will be, um, I think New Zealand will be better than they have been. I'm not convinced that they're good enough to, in say, in say, like the space of five weeks or four weeks, beat, um, well, you know what I mean, like either beat France and finish, and then beat the winner of, and then you know you might argue the semi final might be a sort of reluctant to say weaker side it's the weaker side of the draw and then beat another top team in the final I, I don't think the all blacks will do it so i think there's three sort of clear favorites and i would gun to my head probably just france gun to your head then where are ireland finishing i mean the ireland one the ireland one's so tricky right because yeah. you always you know the, the phrase you know heart rule and head right yeah and I actually feel I'm the other the other way around at the minute. Like my heart is saying something will go wrong. Um, the quarterfinal, not because I want it, but like the Irishness in me and following Irish team and being part of an Irish team with with good hopes. I just feel like the Irish in me um feels like something's gonna go wrong. The 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 logical person is saying of our 33 players, there's probably Kane Healy's probably the only one. Um, who's missed out. So going into World Cup, we've never been the best team in the world before. We've never had so few injuries. Um, we've never had so many players that are genuine world class. We've never had so many. We probably have at least five players that are the top in their position in the world. Um, uh, that's what my uh, sort of the stats tell me. Neil, they're the best disciplined team in the world. They're not far from home. Um all those things are telling me that we are going to be really, 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 really close. But I just have this bad Irishness inside of me thinking something's going to go wrong. So um, where are they going to get to? Um, I think given we can lose a group game and still win that quarterfinal, I don't think we've ever been in a position like that. What I genuinely believe, I, 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 I again, I think we should get to a final. Because if the box beat us, we will get another chance in that quarterfinal against France or New Zealand, which will be a tough game. But I think they're the best team in the world, so I think they'll. I think they'll get to a final. Um, couple more quick ones then, James. Top try score. Who are you going to go for there? Well, I was thinking before coming on this about it, and then I was like, going, geez, I'd like to see the All Blacks could get going, you know, and now Darren's absolutely lambasted the All Blacks there. So we want very few All Blacks tries. Very <laughs> yeah, few. Yeah, Wes Goosen well, slipped well right back. Across the team. Well spread out across the team. He slipped back in. Wes Goosen was going to be my little kind of, uh, you know, maybe he could slip in for a hat trick or four tries or. We don't back to those Japan losing 109 nil, I think it was back in the day. Um, <laughs> just getting certain certain amount of tries. Who's going to be top try scorer? Um, Penno. Darren. I was literally. That's literally exactly who I was thinking as well. Do you know what? If no, I done no, that, no problem in doubling up. I mean, it's a if, logical answer. <laughs> if I was um, if I was more professional as a pundit, I would probably look very hard through the groups and see like a, um, I do a little bit who of work has on particularly easier matchups. So, yeah. There you go. So yeah. somebody's going to score four yeah. against Chile or Portugal, and then that's probably three quarters of the way to being your top try score. Uh, but I think Pe Penno. I think France are going to score a lot of tries. He's a quality player um and it's a bit of a boring answer so apologies for not doing my homework and for doubling up on james's answer no no you could double up on those um just as long as you weren't swapping notes before the the podcast <laughs> um i did have player of the tournament down but i might actually just tweak that now rather than make a prediction on who the the player of the tournament would be i'd be curious to see what player are you just looking forward to seeing most that isn't irish and also isn't antoine dupont because that's that's too easy an answer Finn Russell, Finn Russell in the World Cup over there in France. Hopefully, well, not too much, but um, I just love to see him really achieve something at this top level um, and show the quality that he has. 
just on that consistent basis. You know, it's it's fine doing in Six Nations, it's fine doing Europeans, but in a World Cup, just to see, he doesn't have to do it against Ireland now. He yeah, can, I was gonna, I was gonna, he, was, he can have an off day, he can have an off day against South Africa, just pull the strings and you can just sit back and watch his majestic play. It'd be, it'd be nice, Darren. That, um, that's a way I was gonna I was gonna say Colby, right? It's such a crap answer, and it feels even crapper an answer after that answer, because that's an amazing answer. I think Finn Russell, you know, plays in France the way he's playing, what I'm saying about so I'm changing, I'm copying James again. Um it's a great shout. Uh, I think it's just gonna be uh and listen from a so we're not neutrals when it comes to Scotland, but um he's unpredictable, right? So he's good to watch. Uh, in the end of the day, he gets the ball and he doesn't know what he's going to do. So we definitely don't. And he's capable of, of really, really special things. Also, given where Scotland are and the tournament being in France, I think it's a great shot. Very good. So Finn Russell, as long as he doesn't necessarily do it against Ireland. Well, have an off day. Or, or, he could, or potentially have a stormer against Ireland, but Ireland eke out a, a one or two point win. We'll take that as well. Um, Darren and James, thanks a million for joining us. Enjoy the World Cup. I'm sure we'll be hearing more from me over the next few weeks as well because of all the podcasts we'll be doing but thanks a million for joining us that's our lot for today's pod a reminder we will be back on Thursday evening uh, with reaction to the Ireland team announcement for Saturday's opener against Romania and as well if you have any questions for the panel get them into us either leave a comment on the YouTube video or you can tweet us uh, with the hashtag RTE Rugby we'll, uh, we'll see you then in a couple of days <laughs>